All right, Philippians for Beginners, lesson number five. Title is The Mature Christian Rejoices in Trial. If you're following along in your Bibles, chapter two of Philippians, beginning in verse 14. So, from his prison cell in Rome, Paul writes a letter to the church in Philippi, which he established and uh, which he was very proud of, very proud of that church. And to these brethren who are remaining faithful and fruitful in good works, he sends a message of encouragement and the message is to continue pursuing spiritual maturity and the blessings that come from spiritual maturity. And he breaks down this idea of Christian spiritual maturity into specific virtues and practices that they ought to cultivate. And so he says mature Christians, therefore, uh, they stand firm when they are faced with trial or temptation. Uh, mature Christians imitate Christ in all that they do. Of course, we've covered this already, this little review, he's talked about that already. Today we're going to examine another one of these exhortations to spiritual maturity, and that is rejoicing in trial. So let's go to chapter two. Beginning in verse 14, he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Oh boy. <laughs> just, we just arrived at my address. <laughs> you know, we need to remember that uh, Paul has just explained how he manages to rejoice even though there are some who are preaching the gospel with the express purpose of trying to provoke him to jealousy and envy of their success while he languishes, languishes in prison. So here he lays out the basic attitude for everyday successful living. He says, do all things, not just the things you like to do, do all things, he says, without grumbling or disputing. Interesting words. Grumbling means to mutter or to murmur or to complain. Seeing the negative, pointing out what annoys us and sharing that with other people. Usually uh, muttering you know, includes a charge against those we think responsible for what we disagree with. Now the problem with grumbling or complaining is twofold, and we're talking in, the, I mean, in life in general, but in the church, first of all, it poisons the atmosphere. Since nothing is perfect to begin with, it's easy to point out faults and weaknesses and spoil whatever good there may be about a person or a situation. I mean, it's easy to find what's not good. I mean, about ourselves. It's the easiest thing in the world to find you know, all the places where we fall short, and it's easy to find that about other people. Grumbling also is, it's contagious because it appeals to man's fleshly and sinful nature. Grumblers usually form a complainer's club and they impose their negative attitude on those around them. And it's, a, you know, people like to join that club, the complainers club. Nothing kills the momentum of a good idea or impetus to make necessary changes than constant grumbling from the complainers club. I've known many uh, uh, deacons and you know, hard workers in the church or even elders who just, at some point they just say, Okay, this is just, you know, this is not worth it. You know, I can't go on anymore. I'm so tired of being criticized for every little thing. You, know, you do one thing in the church, you got 500 critics. You know, and I don't blame them, it's, it's a discouraging thing. It's one thing if you're being paid a million bucks to do something and people criticize you, okay, fine. You got your million bucks, be quiet, take your money, go home. But if you're doing something and you volunteered to do it out of the goodness of your heart and for the love of the Lord to serve other people and they complain about you, that's, that's a heavy, that's a very heavy burden. And then he talks also about uh, disputing. Uh, disputing, questioning, second guessing. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking a question or trying to understand or better understand a situation or something that's asked of us. You know, I need more information to be sure I know what you want me to do. That, that's fine. 
But in this case, however, the questioning is part of the grumbling and complaining. So Paul is referring to what people who doubt or refuse to submit do in their resistance to something or someone. They challenge or question or resist the authority, uh, the necessity, the fairness of what may be taking place in the, in the church. Or they reason against the thing that they are complaining about. Now remember the context in which Paul exhorts them to avoid this type of behavior. Okay? He's not just throwing this out you know, in a vacuum. In verse 12, he has told them to work out their salvation in fear and trembling. In other words, mature Christians understand that in their walk of faith with the Lord, there will be an effort by Satan to undermine their belief through various trials and temptations, even direct attacks on their souls. You know when he says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling, it's not fear and trembling of the Lord. He's on your side, he's on our side. I'm not afraid of the Lord. No, he said fear and trembling because there are people out there who want to destroy you. Don't be naive. Christianity is a serious business. It's life and death stuff. Fear and trembling because some have fallen away or succumbed to temptation and they've lost their salvation as a result. So yeah, of course, be afraid. Be serious about your faith, your soul. So in view of this, Paul instructs them not to play into Satan's hands by grumbling or questioning various aspects of their Christian experience especially when facing opposition or trials and personal suffering on account of their faith. It's always, you know, keep your eye on the ball here, it's always about our faith, okay? For example, doubting God's love when suffering or account, uh, on account of one's faith. You do something right, you do something for your faith and it blows up in your, you know, blows up in your face. And he's saying the natural human tendency would be, well, God, why did you do this to me? You know, well, God's not doing that to you. God's not the one that does bad things to hurt you. It's the evil one that does that. God may permit it. He'll permit it to happen, to test your faith. Or complaining about the difficulty or the inconvenience of various types of service or conduct required of us or various complaints or questions concerning the conduct, the sincerity, the value, the authority of fellow Christians, especially those who are responsible for teaching or leadership in the church, favorite pastime in the church. Yeah, let's chew on the elders. <laughs> let's have lunch and chew on the elders for a while. You know? So this type of conduct or attitude actually undermines the development of spiritual maturity in the Christian. Those who grumble and dispute are not usually the ones we look to for encouragement or leadership or an example of Christian maturity. It's not the complainers club that are usually in charge of doing the heavy lifting in the church. He goes on verse 15 and 16, he says, so that you, you know, don't do this, don't grumble and complain, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory, because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. So in these verses, Paul explains how those who avoid these things will be viewed, and the rewards awaiting not only those who refrain from this type of behavior, but also for the one who taught them how to be mature in Christ, meaning himself. So another word here for innocent, you know, he says be blameless and innocent. Another word for innocent, very interesting in the Greek. Um, another way to translate it is to be unmixed. When we think innocent, we think I didn't do anything wrong, I'm not guilty. But when we, when we hear the word unmixed, that, that, that sheds a whole new light on the attitude. The idea is that even though Christians are in the world and constantly come into contact with worldly ideas and people and activities, they remain unmixed. You know, water and oil, 
unmixed. The Christian doesn't kind of mix in with the world. Remain, manages to be among the world but doesn't get mixed into or influenced or affected by the world. So he says this conduct coupled with the fact that they also obey and proclaim the gospel produces light in the dark world of ignorance and sin and, uh, and death. So in verse 16 Paul rejoices in this fact because it means that his work as a teacher and mentor, as well as his personal suffering for the cause of the gospel, will not be for nothing. Let's face it, he's given everything you know, in his life. His health, his wealth, his freedom, he's in jail because of his role as, a, um, as an apostle. He's given everything, you know when they say the, the, the uh, the team left everything on the field, you know, well, he's left everything on the battleground. And he's saying, if you people succeed, meaning if you people are successful in maturing as Christians and you remain faithful, I'll, it, the comfort to me is my life hasn't been a waste of time. You know, your success helps me uh, suffer the things that I'm suffering because I didn't work in vain, I didn't preach in vain. I didn't teach you in vain. My time was not for nothing with you. Verse 17 and 18, he says, but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Verse 17 and 18. So, even though Paul was confident in his imminent release, we talked about that in chapter one, you know, he, he was in jail twice in Rome, so this is the first time, and he, he really felt he would win his case once he came before the emperor and so on and so forth. He really felt he was going to be released. So even though he was confident of his imminent release, he looks to the future and his probable end as a martyr. He sees the writing on the wall. Things are not going good. He may win his case here, but you know, he sees the tide is shifting against uh, Christianity uh, in the capital and he foresees trouble uh, ahead. And so he's thinking, if there's trouble with Christianity, the first to go are going to be the leaders and he's one of the leaders. So in Jewish worship, a drink offering, what he mentions here, in Jewish worship, a drink offering of wine was poured out on the side of the altar, and this represented the fruit of man's work or labor that was offered to God. That was the symbolic way that it was done. So Paul says that he rejoices in the fact that his work or ministry on their behalf is and will probably be offered up in the future through martyrdom. He's going to be a sacrifice offered because of the work, because of this church and he encourages them to share his joy that God would grant him this final opportunity to serve and glorify them. He's thinking, boy, if I die for the faith, it's the best thing that God could have used me for as a martyr for the faith. Now, it's interesting that he uses the drink offering, you, know, you pour something out. He uses the drink offering imagery of poured out wine because as a Roman citizen, his execution would be by decapitation because it was against the Roman law to crucify a Roman citizen. Now, Peter, when he was uh, uh, executed, was crucified and, and history tells us he, he was crucified upside down, not wanting to be crucified the same way that Jesus was. And others uh, were, other Christians were crucified or they were impaled on posts and and, and covered with tar and set on fire you know, to, to serve as like uh, lanterns you know, in the gardens of the, of the emperor. It was a horrific uh, death. You know. But because Paul was a Roman citizen, they were not allowed to uh, execute him in this way. And so his execution would come through decapitation. The idea is when you're decapitated, there's a gush of blood that comes out obviously when your head is cut off. And so he makes the imagery, you know, the, the wine, the red wine is poured out yeah, and I'm going to be poured out. So there's a kind of a parallel there, imagery between the sacrifice and the type of death he thinks that he may uh, experience in the future. All right, 
So Paul leaves you know, the, the lofty vision of his, prob uh, his probable martyrdom in the future and he returns quite abruptly in this passage to matters at hand, namely some information about two of Paul's co-workers, Timothy and Epaphroditus, both examples, both of these men, examples of mature Christians. So he's talking about high things, you know, my, my possible death you know, for in the name of Christ, and then almost like whiplash, he, he comes back and says, oh, and by the way, let me tell you about Timothy and Epaphroditus. After all, it's a letter. <laughs> he's sending a letter, and he's given information in the letter. So we go, to, uh, we go to Timothy. Before we read, let me give you a, a bit of information about Timothy. Well, we first encounter Timothy in Acts chapter 16 while Paul was on his second missionary journey. Uh, Timothy was from Lystra. This was northern Galatia, which is modern day Turkey. Um, and uh, Timothy was part of a church that uh, Paul had established um, around 49 to 53 AD. Timothy's mother Eunice and grandmother Lois were Christians. His father was not. His father was Greek. He was a, an unbeliever. Uh, Timothy joined Paul in 51 AD and along with Luke was one of Paul's closest traveling companions. He ministered to Paul while Paul was in prison, as we see here in the book of Philippians. And he seems to have been a kind of timid man, you know, not an aggressive, go get him type of guy. He was a timid man. He didn't deal well with confrontation and he often had stomach problems, stomach issues, ulcers, you know, he's a you know, queasy stomach. Find out about that in 1 Timothy 5, 23. He was commended into ministry by Paul and the elders of the church and eventually Paul sent him to the church in Ephesus to work with that group of people. So now that you know a little bit about uh, Timothy, let's read verse 19. He says, but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. Remember, uh, Paul expects to be released, but this has not yet happened. His intention is twofold in sending Timothy. Number one, to bring them the news of his release and what condition he's in. You know, no phone calls, no uh, email, no nothing. If, if you wanted information, you had to write it down and somebody had to carry it on foot a thousand miles. So uh, communication was slow. Uh, secondly, he wants to send Timothy to bring information. And secondly, to assess their situation and bring news back to Paul about the Philippians. How's the church doing? Ask people, you know, meet with them, find out how everyone is doing, and then bring that information back to me. So Paul's hope is that Timothy will both bring and return with good news that will encourage everyone. So let's read. He says, for I have no one else, speaking of Timothy now, for I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately, as soon as I see how things go with me, and I trust in the Lord that I myself will also be coming shortly. Paul here describes Timothy as one who cares about the church, specifically the Philippians, as much as he does. They're equally yoked in their concern for the welfare of the Philippian brethren. He contrasts Timothy with the preachers that, remember he talked about the preachers who were just preaching out of jealousy and envy for money, whatever. He compares Timothy's attitude to these guys that we've talked about in the past. He uh, compares Timothy with the preachers he spoke about in the first chapter, that's it. Men who preached for gain or to provoke jealousy and envy in Paul. Timothy, he says, on the contrary, uh, is not like these men, having faithfully served with Paul and considered by Paul not simply a co-worker, but a beloved son serving his father, very much like Jesus served the father, Timothy serves Paul. This person, that Paul loves as a son, who is a faithful and mature Christian worker, will be sent to encourage them as, a, as soon as Paul has definite news about his release from prison, uh, which he thinks to be sent. You know, I, I, I 
I've said it before, it's just so amazing. It's so human. People read the Bible and they, they see it way up there in the sky. It's, he's right, he's in jail. He thinks he's going to be released, but the, the wheels of justice turn very slowly. We're not talking about days, we're talking about months and months. You know? It's looking good, but it may not be till the fall and we're only in February, you know, when I, that, that type of thing. So he says, I'm going to send, you know, I'm writing to you. I'm going to send you some news about what's going on with me and what I think is going to happen. And, and Timothy is going to deliver the letter and I want him to find out what's going on with you people. And, and then he's going to come back and bring that news back to me. And that way you'll be encouraged knowing that I have hope to be freed and I'll be encouraged because he'll bring news back from you guys that you're doing okay, that you're hanging in there, that you're being faithful. So human, so natural. So in the meantime, uh, he, so he's sending, he, you know, he wants to send Timothy and Timothy will come back, but in the meantime, he's going to do something else. In the meantime, he's going to send Epaphroditus because he wants Timothy to stay with him until he finds out what happens legally. And that may take some time. So we're going to find out about Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, this brother, sometimes referred to by the contracted form of his name, Epaphras, so Epaphras, Epaphroditus, Michael, Mike, you know, Epaphras, Epaphroditus. Uh, the name means handsome, not Mike, Epaphroditus <laughs> means handsome, is referred to as one who first preached to the Colossians, Colossians 1.7, and was sent by the Philippian church with a gift for Paul and to find out about his circumstances. So Epaphroditus, he comes from that area, Philippi, and he's, he brought a gift, money, to Paul while he's in jail, bringing some news from them and wanting to get news from him. Now we don't have a lot of information about Epaphroditus other than his appearance here with Paul and a reference to him as one of the early missionaries who may have planted the church in his home city of Colossae. You know, the, the, the letter to the Colossians. Well, the Colossians were in Colossae and Epaphroditus was from Colossae. So we, we believe that he's the one that planted the church there, not far from, from uh, Ephesus. So let's read a little about him in Philippians. He says, but I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. So Timothy has to stay until he finds out what's going to happen with me, but in the meantime, I'm going to send Epaphroditus to give you news. All right. So Paul's going to wait until he has definite information before sending Timothy. He sends Epaphroditus at the same time saying thank you for the gift that you sent from him. Uh, again, not much personal history or historical information in the Bible about this man, but the little we do have points to a very good picture of a mature Christian servant. Note, listen, in just one passage, note what Paul says about him in one verse, verse 25, he calls him a brother in the Lord. So he belongs to you know, the Christian family. He calls him a fellow worker, a helper in the task of preaching and teaching the gospel. He calls him a soldier, someone to carry the fight on with Paul. He calls him a messenger, not a messenger boy, but a duly appointed commissioner sent by the church for a specific task. He calls him a minister. He was specifically sent by the Philippians to serve Paul's needs while in prison, not simply sent to deliver a gift of money for his support. Big difference. So Paul adds an explanation concerning Epaphroditus' return. Apparently, he was sent to stay and help Paul in his work, but shortly after his arrival in Rome, Epaphroditus fell seriously ill. The news of his near fatal illness got back to the Philippians somehow and they began to worry, not knowing of his condition, whether he survived or not. Today we call the hospital, this is Mr. Smith, I'm calling about Mrs. Smith, she's in room 322, is she out of surgery? Yes, she's in recovery, everything went well, thank you very much. In those days it wasn't like that, obviously. Uh, the news took months. So we read in 226, uh, he says, because, speaking of Epaphroditus, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death. 
but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. In a way, Paul was giving up any further service or comfort that Epaphroditus could have provided him by sending you know, this brother back sooner with this letter, not wanting them to suffer any more anguish and anxiety about his condition. Note that Paul says that God healed Epaphroditus since he was at the point of death. Apparently no doctors or man-made remedies had been able to, to work on him. So Epaphroditus goes with a gift of money. He's supposed to be there to help Paul and to do stuff. Instead, he falls you know, deathly ill. Verse 29 and 30, Paul says, Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service uh, to me. So Paul sends him back with an exhortation to the Philippians to receive him with honor. Uh, why? Because he risked his life to carry out the task they sent him to complete and receive him with joy because God saved him. Paul was encouraged by him and the Philippians' choice of him for this mission, and this mission was justified. In other words, you chose the right guy. It was a long trip between Philippi and Rome, very long trip. Things did not go the way that they had planned. Epaphroditus delivers the gift, he stays to minister, he returns when Paul is freed. That was the plan. Instead, he, he delivers the gift, he falls ill, nearly dies. And when he is healed, Paul sends him straight back. But with God's help, nevertheless, even though the plan didn't go as planned, they have reason to rejoice because Paul receives their gift and is due to be freed soon and expected and Epaphroditus is saved from death and returns home safely. So Paul, in encouraging the Philippians to strive for spiritual maturity, notes that one mark of a mature Christian is the lack of complaining and arguing in dealing with various challenges and associated with living among unbelievers in a fallen world or carrying out Christian service and ministry. And we have examples of it here, don't we? He then provides examples of Christian maturity as embodied in two of his coworkers, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, who each, without grumbling or negative questioning, carried out their ministries in such a way that God was honored, the church was edified, and non-believers were exposed to the light of the gospel. So, excuse me, so far in his letter, Paul has demonstrated that cultivating spiritual maturity requires that Christians stand firm. In, you want to be mature? You want to be considered mature as a Christian? has nothing to do with your age, although there should be some parallels there. But if you want to be mature as a Christian, you need to stand firm in the faith, imitate Christ in action and reaction. You know the old, the old thing, what would Jesus do? That's, that's a pretty good guideline. What would Jesus do? And rejoice in times of trial. In the passage describing his imprisonment and future martyrdom, and then talking about Epaphroditus' illness, it's amazing to realize that Paul uses the word joy or rejoice six times. <laughs> Imagine how many times he'd use those words if things were going well. All right, so we're going to stop there as far as the studying the text. One lesson, you know, usually try to draw a lesson or two, some practical things. Just one lesson, okay? Ministry is never without trials. There's the lesson. As far as we know, Paul was never persecuted or made to suffer because he was a Pharisee. As long as he was a Pharisee, nobody persecuted him. He didn't suffer. He didn't lose any money, he didn't lose any sleep. He was held in high regard, he was promoted, encouraged. He was a man on the way up, so long as he was a Pharisee. It was after his conversion, and more importantly, when he began to minister by speaking out concerning the Christ, that the pushback came. 
So the more effective and fruitful his ministry, the greater the trials and obstacles and persecution became. Listen, when they have to kill you to shut you up, the world is paying you the best compliment on the effectiveness of your ministry and your witness. <laughs> if they have to kill you to shut you up, you're doing something right as far as Christ is concerned. I don't mean being executed as a criminal. I mean if they have to you know, violently put you down because you're just being way too effective as a Christian, you're doing something right. This is why both Paul in this section and Peter in the book of Acts chapter 4, 23 and 24 and then in 541, both Peter and Paul rejoiced when threatened with death because of their ministry. They weren't masochists. They weren't like, oh yeah, boy, I'm going to get whipped. You know, I like that. No, no, no. No, they knew that they were getting to the other side because there was pushback. And so the lesson for us today is that we shouldn't be surprised or discouraged or give in to whining or second guessing God when our efforts to improving ourselves or doing something good for someone else or serving the church in some way, when these efforts are met with personal difficulties or ingratitude or indifference or unfair accusations or all kinds of roadblocks, that's normal, that's normal. The moment a Christian makes an effort to grow, to expand his or her service, to give more time and effort or money to the church, this is a threat to the evil one. This is a threat to the enemy spirits that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter six. They don't like us succeeding. They like us kind of lukewarm and quiet and not move around too much, not make too much noise, you know, don't rock the boat, yeah. They don't want the gospel spread, so any effort to do so will be opposed by them. And unfortunately, many times the opposition doesn't come from outside the church, it comes from inside the church. From whom? Well, the grumblers and the complainers. Why are we spending so much money on evangelizing over here? You know, why, why are we having this gospel meeting? Whatever, you know, we're going to expand the building so we can have more people. No, no, that's way too much. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll never do it. It'll never work. Oh if, I, oh, if I could have money for every time somebody said to me, it'll never work. <laughs> we'll never be able to do that. The opposition don't want people to believe, so they will fill the road to belief with all kinds of obstacles, temptations, false teachers, hypocritical Christians. They don't want Christians who are sitting on the bench to get into the game playing offense, and their most subtle and vicious and powerful attacks are reserved for Christians who want to mature, who want to become more like Christ. So our chances of meeting and overcoming our enemy in our efforts to mature in Christ will greatly increase if we know that there is an enemy <laughs> and he will attack if you decide that you're going to, you know, I'm going for it. I don't like where I'm at as a Christian. I'm, I'm going to take the next step, whatever that next step is. You can be sure that you will hit opposition. Now, on the other side, we need to remember God equips us for the eventual attack. He provides us His word. He provides us His spirit. He provides us the church. And He intervenes so we don't become overwhelmed. For example, in the passage that we just read, God saved Epaphroditus from death because his death may have overwhelmed Paul and the Philippians at that time when he was nearing the end of a long and difficult time in prison. It might have just been one thing, just too many that would crush him. So Paul rejoiced and encouraged the Philippians to rejoice despite these trials because they knew that their suffering was caused by and in service to the gospel of Jesus. They suffered as he suffered. God was with them and helping them bear under these trials. Their rejoicing was a witness that the Spirit was in them as Christians 
um, and was exceedingly greater than the evil spirit that was in the world that caused their suffering. What does John say? The spirit that's in you is greater than the spirit that's in the world. There's a spirit in the world and he is against and opposes faith. But there's a spirit within us that wishes, wishes to proclaim the faith and do the works that God has put before us uh, in order to do, to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. In the end, their rejoicing in the midst of trial signaled that even though they may have lost the physical battle, they won the spiritual war. And that's our battle. We're small, you know, Christians, we have a small voice. We don't have a very big stage. You know, some Hollywood actor you know, wants to shout out some obscenity about something. His face will be on the front page of the news, or her face will be on the front page of the newspaper, all over Facebook and whatever, you know, a gazillion hits. You want to say something that's actually true <laughs> from God, yeah, you, yeah, you know, they, you, they don't give you the time of day. Brothers and sisters, it isn't by accident that all the platforms that control communication are held by non-believers. This is why, again, I'll plug Bible Talk. This is why, and, and Bible Talk is not the only ministry, but ministries like Bible Talk, we push back. We use their platforms to push back with a message of faith, with the message of Christ. Okay, that's our class for today. We're going to Keep right on going until we finish. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>